Okay, now, from now on, like we've done our basics, like uh, what is demand, elasticity of demand and everything. But how does demand, you know, is determined by the consumer choices, right? How does a consumer affect the overall, you know, demand in the market? That is what we are going to study in the theory of consumer behavior. Now, the background goes like, initially, we had a very prominent school of thought that was the cardinal school of thought, right? In which it was like clearly mentioned that we can measure the utility. Utility is objective in nature. We can measure that how much satisfaction we are getting out of it, right? So that was one very prominent characteristic of the cardinal school of thought that the utility, utility can be measured. But what is actually utility? Utility is the amount of satisfaction, the satisfaction one gets, okay, out of consuming a product or consuming a commodity, the satisfaction which one gets is the utility, right? And Marshall also said that utility will be determined, right? Why and how can we, uh, you know, test this um, objectivity nature of the utility is that how much a person is willing to pay for a commodity determines the utility that the consumer derives. So if the consumer is willing to pay a high price for a commodity, means that utility is going to give a high amount of, you know, that commodity is going to give a high amount of utility to the consumer. So this utility can be measured, right, in cardinal numbers with the help of the price a consumer is willing to spend on that particular commodity, right? And because of this factor, the cardinal school of thought said that you can measure the utility simply by knowing what a price a consumer is ready to pay, okay? So what are the characteristics? Now, why here, let's say I have used the word objective in terms of measuring, but why here they're using subjective is because somewhere down the line as individuals, right, you may be willing to pay a higher price for a commodity, I may not be, right? So every individual ha will have his or her own preferences, okay? So that is why, and it can differ from individual to individual, your perspective can be different. My perspective can be different. And based on that, that is why we say that utility is subjective in nature, depending upon a person's choice, a person's thought and a person's willing to pay. Okay. Second thing is, it will also reflect the satisfaction. The satisfaction one gets right, out of consuming a commodity will be measured by the term utility, okay? And also, it is based on introspection, how a person can individually treat that commodity. So, for example, if one smokes, right, so the one who is smoking, he's getting more utility out of that, right? But the one who does not, is not getting that utility. So obviously the one who is smoking will be willing to pay a price for that. But one who is not will not be able, willing to do that, right? So it is also on the introspection that how one treats a commodity. For one person, that smoke is a good. For the other, it is a bad, right? Or it is like in cardinal terms, we never mention good or bad basically, but we say that that person will not get a utility out of it, okay? Then it is measured in terms, in relative terms, right? So for example, one thing can give you higher utility. Somebody likes to have rice, somebody likes to have flour, right, rotis, right? So how one is willing to, you know, spend or pay a price for that particular commodity is measured in relative terms, okay? So how much, for example, if you go out on a family gathering to a restaurant, some are willing to buy rice and some are willing to buy rotis. So how one is willing to spend on that commodity is measured through 
utility that what utility that person is deriving from that consumption and also it is ethically neutral as i mentioned there is nothing good or bad in economics right in economics in case of cardinal thought there is nothing good or bad okay there is everything is a good but the level of goodness will vary for somebody it will give them a high level of utility and for others it may not give them any kind of utility okay so these are the important characteristics of your utility another thing which we have to determine is the important terms that are related to utility aspect so for example we have total utility right now total utility is the amount of utility a person will get from consuming a commodity okay so for example just a second what is happening okay mm -hmm. hmm right so for example we are saying that one unit of a commodity right one unit of a commodity say gives you 100 utils okay just a second okay yeah so one unit of a commodity is giving a person 100 utils okay that is one level now if a person consumes another a consecutive unit in the same period with no back you know no lag as such the consumption is continuous that is very important here there is no lag here consumption is going to be continuous so if the consumer spends the second unit again probably that second unit will give that consumer say 90 utils of satisfaction right so this is the marginal utility but total utility will be your addition the total the total amount of utility you are getting from every all the you all the units of a commodity that are consumed together right so total utility will be 100 in the case of first then in the case of second it would be 100 plus 90 that would be 190 right in the third for example the marginal utility you derive from it would be say 80 right so in the third unit the total utility would be 190 plus 80 so it would be 270 right and so on right so your total utility is nothing but the summation of marginal utilities on the other hand your marginal utility is the additional utility you are getting on consuming a consecutive unit of that commodity i repeat the consumption is constant so for example uh, let's just say that uh, okay you've had one cup of coffee and it gave you say 100 utils of satisfaction okay if you'll have second unit of coffee or second uh, number of coffee probably it will give you 90 utils of satisfaction but if there is a time lag right so if you have the same cup of coffee after one week probably it will give you again a 100 units of uh, utils of satisfaction okay so this is not going to go with the theory and it will make the calculations very complex so to keep it at you know as in at an easier level the assumption that is made is that the consumption the consumption of that commodity is continuous in nature there is no lag or there is no break okay so this is another thing these are the two terms okay then as far as the diagram is concerned the relationship is concerned 
we are we know that as and when as you start consuming a commodity the marginal utility you derive from that commodity will continuously decrease okay and when it is decreasing when it is decreasing then the total utility curve which you'll get will be concave in nature okay and the topmost point would be your point of saturation point of saturation and beyond this point of saturation to the right right then your marginal utility would become negative because it is of no use to consume that commodity any further okay so the marginal utility curve goes like this is the topmost point right so it will be a downward sloping curve touching zero at the point of saturation corresponding to the point of saturation and beyond that it becomes negative okay so when total utility curve is increasing at a diminishing rate then your marginal utility curve is falling and reaches zero when total utility curve is at the maximum point and when the total utility curve starts falling, the marginal utility curve becomes negative. Okay? Now, coming on to the cardinal school of thought, right? So, cardinal school of thought, the main idea is that you can measure everything, right? You can measure it. So, the utility, we can measure it, right? The satisfaction that we are deriving from a commodity, we can measure it, right? So, this name is very important. Firstly, the concept of utility was originally given by Jeremy Bentham and it was formally introduced by Jevons. Please, this is very important, okay? Then, Assumptions. Again, one term which they have used to measure utility is the utils. That whatever there is a unit attached to it and the utility is measured in terms of util. Just like money is measured in terms of rupee, weight is measured in terms of kgs. Similarly, utility is measured in terms of utils. And this utils is calculated by the price a person is willing to pay for a commodity. Okay. The second is that a consumer is rational. He will take a sensible decision. It will not go in for an irrational kind of a behavior. Okay. Then your money is the measuring mode of utility. As I said, that price will determine the price a consumer is willing to pay will determine the satisfaction level that is why the money money is a measuring mode of utility and money plays a very important role but another thing is that marginal utility of money is constant though this assumption was highly criticized later but according to the cardinal analysis a marginal utility for money is constant. So the value of rupees 100 for a labor and the value, this assumption only implies that the value of rupees 100 for a labor is equal to how Ambani's value rupees 100. Okay, so this assumptions, assumption implies that. And this was given by Daniel Bernal, but he just wanted to make the task easier. That if marginal utility of money is variable, then it would be very difficult to measure utility. He just wanted to make this, you know, uh, measuring, measuring term as constant. That was the only thing, right? If this would have been, you know, variable for all the individuals, for everybody, then it would be very difficult to identify the utility level. Okay, the fifth is that utilities are additive in nature. 
means if you are adding utilities. So we are adding utilities to get total utility. So that means they can be added. Okay. And then very important is that utilities are independent of each other. So you may be consuming n number of goods. For you, the uh, for example, the Chinese consumption of Chinese food you get you eat, you know, that is, gives you a different utility. But then immediately, if you go to say dominoes, then probably that would give you an independent kind of a utility. These two are not related. Again, this criticism, there is a criticism for it, but then just for simplicity, they made this assumption that commodity consumption of one commodity does not affect the utility derived from the other commodity, right? And then it is based on introspection. Again, how you and me treat a commodity can be different, right? So, the whole theory is based on how a person perceives a commodity. Okay. Now, there are two laws. Two laws under this Marshallian analysis. First is the law of diminishing marginal utility. That is our Boston's first law. And this was law of diminishing marginal utility was also the reason for a downward sloping demand curve and what does this law of diminishing marginal utility says that as consumer consumes more and more of a commodity the marginal utility derived from it keeps on declining and we use this principle on a daily basis so if you're having say uh, mm, let's just say if you're having rotis in a meal right one unit of roti would give you a different satisfaction. The second roti would give you a lesser satisfaction. The third would give you even lesser satisfaction. And by fourth, probably you will be done with it. Right? No more. So we use this principle on a daily basis in our lives. Okay? Similarly, let's just take the cla uh, this class example. One hour of study. Okay, fine, done. If I stretch it to two hours, Okay, we need to finish the syllabus. Let's do it. Take care, take care. But then if I give you a third hour of lecture, you'll be like, no, we are exhausted. Right? No more of it. Thank you so much. Right? So law of diminish diminishing marginal utility says that as we consume more and more of a unit, continuously, very important, continuously, the marginal utility derived from it keeps on decreasing. Okay. And then we have point of satiation that is where your total utility is maximum. That is this point and or your marginal utility is zero. The corresponding same point. Okay. But one thing which we need to understand here is that if you are making an assumption that utilities are independent, that means the goods are not perfect substitutes. We are not taking this relation or related goods into picture. Okay? Right. So, this law depends on following. First is that it is possible, unrealistic thing, that it is possible to satisfy each single want. Right. While economics starts from the principle that human wants are unlimited and resources are scarce, but when we apply this in an individual, uh, you know, scenario, then we say that total human wants are unlimited and we can satisfy them as well. Also, the different goods are not perfect substitutes for each other, means they cannot be substituted. They are not related goods. They cannot be substituted with one another. And then we have that marginal utility of money is 
constant. We are keeping the mode of measurement as constant for all the individuals. Okay. Now, but there was this problem here. The diamond water paradox. Right. So, this was posed by Adam Smith. This was not solved by Adam Smith, but he posed this, this problem that there is this water diamond paradox where water gives you a higher utility as compared to diamond, right? But the price that we are willing to pay for water is way less than for diamonds because diamonds are of actually no utility except one or once or twice or whatever. Even it's not that, right? But water you need every day, every moment, right? Then why is the case that diamonds are priced higher and not the water? But this was with respect, this problem was res uh, resolved using the supply side economics. That simply because the supply of water is abundant, right? That is why water is priced lower than the diamond, right? Diamonds are not easy to find. That's why they're priced lower, right? Similarly, if you see the difference these days between lab-grown diamonds and mined diamonds, lab-grown diamonds are one-tenth of the cost of mined diamonds, right? Simply because they are more in supply as compared to mined diamonds. Okay, so this was the diamond water paradox. And please remember that this problem was posed by Adam Smith. Okay, so what is the significance of this? Again, as I said, that it explains the inverse relationship between demand and price. Okay, and also it determines the paradox of value right that your marginal utility marginal utility is the one which determines the price of the commodity and not the total utility right so simply because if the uh, product if the commodity is available it would become less desirable and hence low price so therefore the marshall's marshall's law of dmu solved the problem that was posed by Adam Smith. Okay. Clear till here? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Now, the second theory under this is your Gossens second law, that is your law of equi-marginal utility. Now you have to remember these Gossens first law and second law, okay? So they usually do ask such MCQs here, okay? Now, this law basically states that the last rupee, the utility that is derived from the last rupee spent should be should be equal to the rest of the commodities. Okay. Now, this law is only applicable when we know that the consumer is consuming more than one commodity. So, this would say that the consumer has to allocate, has to allocate his resources in such a way Right, that if he spends 100 rupees on good one, 100 rupees on good two, 100 rupees on good three, 400 rupees on good four, etc. Right, so the marginal utility that is derived, derived from it should be equal for all. Right, he should be able to spend his income rationally to get the maximum set a satisfaction. And that is why this law is also known as law of substitution, law of maximum satisfaction, and the principle of proportionality between prices and marginal unit. So the budget, the income of the consumer is divided between multiple goods in such a way that marginal utility that is derived from each of the good, consumption of each of the good is equal to one another. Okay, so the assumptions in this case is that the income of the consumer is fixed, 
prices do not change. So this price does not change because if this would change, again, it would make the calculations complex. Then there are substitutes available. So if we are taking multiple commodities into account, that means substitutes are available. So probably a consumer can think that it's okay, I can buy two units of good one and okay, three units of good two, right? So su substitutes are available. But again, the law of diminishing marginal utility will operate. So if there is a single good, the utility, the equilibrium would be achieved when marginal utility is equal to price. And when there are several goods available in the market, then that would mean that utility would be achieved when the ratio of marginal utility to price would be the same for all the commodities. Okay. Now, what is the importance of it? It helps in identifying the consumer's expenditure in the sense that how much a consumer is willing to spend on different commodities. And also it will help in, you know, estimating whether there are savings or how much is the consumption in the economy. Then on the basis of what, how many commodities a person is actually willing to consume will determine the prices. And then it helps in distribution, production, exchange, and public finance. That how a consumer is willing to distribute his resources for other goods. And accordingly, the production, the, you know, the demand will be, uh, you know, uh, estimated. And then after that, the production will be estimated and so on. Right? But again, the assumptions that Marshall took were so unrealistic that obviously it had to be written in the criticisms. So first was that this theory is not practical, right? Because we as consumers will never go for this consumption, right? So we will not be like, okay, this is the utils, let's consume it. No, 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 we don't do that. We don't do that. We just consume a commodity straightforward and without thinking that how much satisfaction one is, you know, getting out of it. We want it, we take it. Okay. And also utilities are different for each individual. Each individual. So when we get to calculate, it would be very difficult to identify that what kind of a product should be produced to ensure maximum satisfaction because it is so subjective in nature that it is very difficult to estimate, estimate the demand of the consumer. And also the marginal utility of money cannot be constant. So if Ambani is spending crores of rupees on the wedding, I don't know, thousands of crores of a wedding of rupees in the wedding, probably for him 100 rupees would mean nothing. Right. But on the other hand, a laborer for him, 100 rupees would be everything. Right. So marginal utility of money cannot be kept constant. Then Marshall ignored the income effect. Right. So we'll study this later that price effect into uh, is divided into substitution and income effect. So Marshall only explained the substitution effect. He did not take into account the income effect. It was only Slutsky later on that Hicks and Slutsky who actually, you know, decomposed price effect into income effect and substitution effect. And also, when you're saying that marginal utility is determined by the price of the commodity, what about the Giffen goods, right? Giffen goods show an, in, a, a positive relationship between price and quantity demanded, right? So with an increase in price, right, he will demand more of it, but the marginal utility will decrease, right? So he was unable to explain the Giffen paradox in case of Marshallian theory, okay? Now take a moment and read through things, like just go through the Marshallian analysis once.
All good? Mm, yes, ma'am. Okay. Now, the next thing is your ordinal or Hicksian analysis. Now, Hicks thought that having utils as a term and then measuring your utility is a very complex procedure. Instead, the consumer does not go in for you know measuring the utility. He does not write it down somewhere. But yes, consumers instead have preferences. Right? If you're given an amount, say for example, 100, right? If you're given that amount, you would probably want to spend it on a sweet thing than chips or something, right? So that is your preference because probably the sweets would give you more utility as compared to the other snacks, right? So the utility that a consumer, consumer, you know, uh, achieves out of consuming a commodity can be judged about from the preferences, from the rank. And that is why ordinal or Hicksian analysis says that utilities can only be ranked, right? For me, this pen, this pen, this pen, these three pens would give me different kind of utilities, right? And I can rank them, okay? Now, assumptions are that they are ordinal. They can be ranked. Utility is ordinal and it can be ranked. It cannot be measured. Another thing that consumer is rational, right? Then third, very important term. And there was a question asked on this as well. That indifference curve is based on weak ordering. Now, weak ordering is that where not just there are preferences, right? There may be combinations of goods where you can prefer one good over another. But in case of indifference curves, there are also combinations of two goods where you are indifferent, where a consumer cannot order them. It is difficult for the consumer to order them. And as a result, they're indifferent between them. Right, And when this indifference, the characteristic of indifference comes into picture, we say that it is a weak ordering. Then the consumption follows a transitive pattern in the sense that if A is preferred to B, B is preferred to C, then automatically A will be preferred to C. This is the transitive pattern. Then completeness means there would be a choice will be made. A choice will be made and there will be some sort of, you know, uh, relationship that will be determined. You can either identify that, okay, the consumer is preferring A over B. You can actually identify this relationship, A over B, or consumer is indifferent between A and B. There would be some kind of a relationship, preference or indifference. There would be something or the other which will be established. And then we are assuming continuity in consumption. There, the consumption is continuous, one after another, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Right? It won't be like you consume one commodity today and second commodity one year down the line. No, you are consuming it continuously. And that's why we are getting marginal utility, a diminishing marginal utility. Right, And last assumption is that the marginal rate of substitution is diminishing. So, for example, for example, if you are taking, say, okay, you have two options, okay? Having a uh, chocolate and having chips, okay? So you can give up, say, two pieces of chocolate for one additional unit of chips, right? But for the second unit of chips, probably you are just willing to sacrifice two or sorry, just willing to sacrifice 1.5 pieces of chocolates because the second, util, the second unit of chips 
would give you lesser utility and as a result as a result you will be willing to sacrifice the lesser amount of the other commodity for it so simply because your marginal utility aspect is decreasing in nature that is why we say that your the ordinal analysis says that there is a diminishing marginal rate of satisfaction in the sense that as you consume more of say good y the sacrifice of good x would keep on decreasing with every consecutive unit okay so this would be like mm -hmm. just a second. Oh, something is wrong right so for mrs it will be how much of your y you're willing to sacrifice for one unit of x, one additional unit of x. And this will be measured with the help of marginal utility of x divided by your marginal utility of y. And this MRS is also the slope of your indifference curves. Okay, and then the dominance, the monotonicity means more of a good will give you greater satisfaction. So you will obviously prefer more of the goods, right? And this also says it is because of this assumption that a higher indifference curve will give you a higher level of utility, okay? Now, indifference curves. So while we are done with the assumptions, so indifference curves basically, basically shows that different, different combinations of the two goods that give you same level of satisfaction. This is X, this is Y. So probably combination A, combination B, combination C, combination D, right? they will give you the same level of satisfaction and the consumer would be indifferent between all these bundles, right? And the slope of indifference curve is MRS, right? So if we go for, say, the curves, right? Any point, any point above the indifference curve would definitely be better, right? And any point below the indifference curve would be considered as inferior. So points above the indifference curve would be better, but they can be unaffordable for the consumer. But and the points below the indifference curve are inferior. So in any case, the consumer will not prefer this commodity. Okay? Okay. Now, we are saying, we are saying that why, why MRS why MRS is decreasing in nature simply because you are able to satisfy each and every want, right? So as you consume a commodity, you are reaching a point of satisfaction, okay? And also, the goods are imperfect substitutes of each other. So if you are like, for example, you are eating roti or rice, Right. But at some point you will be like, no, I need roti as well. I cannot have rice all the time. Right. So these goods are not perfect substitutes of each other. They can be considered as substitutes, but they're not perfect substitutes. One person always gets bored of eating the same thing again and again. Right. That's why your MRS is decreasing simply because of the need. 
to consume the other commodity as well. Okay. Now, what are the properties of your indifference curves? Right. First property is that they are downward sloping. Right. They are downward sloping. That is why each unit of a good gives you higher level, same level of satisfaction. Now, what if the indifference curve were, would be upper, like upward sloping? What if your indifference curve is like this, right? Then the point, say for example, this is the point A and this is the point B. Okay, now point A, so sorry, point B, we know that we are getting more of both the goods here, right? So, and one thing we've studied is that more of both the goods would be preferred. It will give you more satisfaction. So that assumption will be nullified here. Okay, that assumption will be nullified. Another property of indifference curve is the convex nature is the convex nature of your indifference curve okay now in the sense let's just take this where should i write okay let me just identify this place okay so now if if the indifference curves are concave in nature Let's just say this is concave. Okay. So this is one unit of say good X, two unit of good Y, sorry, good X and third unit of good X. Now if we see that this is say X1, your Y1. Okay. Right. Now when we move from one to two units of good X, you are sacrificing this level of good Y, right? This gap. This level of good Y you are sacrificing to consume one additional unit of it. Then, when you are consuming the third unit, you are sacrificing even more of good Y. So, this is actually violating the assumption that as you increase the consumption of a commodity, you are sacrificing more and more of it. And with this, we cannot say that marginal utility is diminishing in nature. No. So that is why your indifference curves are convex to the origin. Now, the third is that indifference curves cannot intersect one another. Okay. Now, what if they do? What if they do, right? So, this is your indifference curve 1, right? And this is your indifference curve 2. Now, at this point A, where the two curves are intersecting, right? Here, the good is like both the level, both the indifference curves are giving equal satisfaction, okay? But what if at this point, Say X and then you take this point Y. So logically, logically, Y would give you lesser satisfaction as compared to X. But again, we know that all the points on the indifference curve gives you equal satisfaction. So we are just, you know, violating so many assumptions here. So at point A, while indifference curve both the indifference curves are giving you equal satisfaction. By that logic, X and Y should also give you equal satisfaction. But as Y, as Y lies below X, so it is evident that Y is giving you lesser satisfaction as compared to X. And hence, the assumption is violated. So that is why we say that Two indifference curves never intersect. They never intersect. Okay. And then higher indifference curve means higher satisfaction. Means more is preferred to less. 
So a higher indifference curve would give you higher level of satisfaction. And also the indifference curves do not touch the axis, right? Simply because you want to, you will have to consume all the commodities. It is not like you can stay without consuming one commodity, right? So that is why we say that they do not touch the axis in the sense to survive, you need to consume X and Y both, okay? Ma'am? What are the shapes, the exceptional shapes of indifference curves? So if the goods are perfect substitutes, means they can perfectly substitute one from one for another. Ma'am? Yes. Uh, Ma'am, I have a doubt regarding the uh, this uh, property number A, first one. Okay. I did not understand that. The downward sloping? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So, now let's just do it again. If there are two goods, X and Y, okay? And if your curve is upward sloping, okay? So, here you are getting one unit of Y and one unit of X. And another curve is... Another point is like this, where you are getting two units of Y and two units of X. One thing we say is that all the points on the indifference curve give you equal satisfaction. But here, we are also seeing that the more you consume of both the goods, more satisfaction you will get, right? So this point B is more than A for both the commodities. You are doubling the commodity that you are consuming, right? So it should give you more satisfaction then. More is preferred to less, right? So at one point, we are saying that A and B should be indifferent to one another. And another thing which is, comes out is that because B is getting both of like more of both the commodities, X and Y, then B should give you higher satisfaction logically. So there are two assumptions parallelly running with one another. So that is why the assumption of an upward sloping, an upward sloping indifference curve is cancelled out. And that is why we say that your indifference curve is always downward sloping. Is it okay? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Now, what are the different shapes of the indifference curves that we have? First is that perfect substitutes. MRS is constant. You know that you can con you know, perfectly substitute one commodity for another in the sense like you go to a vegetable market, right? There are perfect substitutes. One piece of tomato is same as other piece of tomato. So marginal rate of substitution for X and Y is constant. And when this is the case, you will get a downward sloping demand curve this in, uh, indifference curve sorry so this implies that as you increase the consumption of good x by one unit the level of sacrifice of good y that you make will be constant so if you see the curve the level of sacrifice you're making for the good for good y right then that is constant and hence we have a straight downward sloping indifference curve. Okay. Perfect substitutes. Now, in case of perfect complements, you cannot, you have to consume these two goods together. You cannot substitute one for another. So for this, MRS XY is equal to zero. Right shoe, left shoe. You cannot substitute one for another. So, in this case, the perfect complements, the indifference curve will be L-shaped. Why? No matter. you, For example, you have one right shoe, right? But 10 left shoes. So, how much will be useful for you? One right and one left only. Rest nine, uh, you know, left shoes would be useless for you. Okay? So, that is why the indifference curves in case of perfect substitution is L-shaped and we can only have a corner solution in this case. Similarly, if you have 
टू राइट शूज एंड टेन लेफ्ट शूज सो हाउ मेनी वुड बी यूजफुल फॉर यू इट विल बी टू राइट एंड टू लेफ्ट रेस्ट एट लेफ्ट शूज वुड बी यूजलेस इट वोट मैटर टू यू ओके देन नाउ वेर वन वी हैव स्टडीड दैट योर इंडिफरेंस कर्व इज डाउनवर्ड स्लोपिंग देर आर केसेस वेन देर आर अपवर्ड स्लोपिंग एज वेल सो इट इज ओनली वेन वन कमोडिटी इज अ गुड दैट इज वन कमोडिटी गिवज यू यूटिलिटी एंड द अदर कमोडिटी गिवज यू डिस यूटिलिटी सो फॉर एग्जाम्पल योर पोल्यूशन एंड ट्रीज so trees sorry not <laughs> trees i'm sorry trees okay so right so to compensate for pollution you need more of trees more the pollution more the trees you need and that is why your indifference curve is upward sloping in this case because to cover up with the disutility disutility you get from a bad good you have to consume more and more of the good good okay then also we have your circular indifference curve right now circular indifference curve is when the consumer when the consumer after consuming two goods is trying to reach an optimal combination of it right so this is the point of bliss you get this is an exceptional case especially when the goods are rare to find when the goods are rare right so to reach a satisfaction level you get an a circular kind of an indifference curve right so this is the thing okay this thing should be here the this line this is possible when the consumer has excess of a commodity his satisfaction can be increased reducing that bad this one with this point okay hmm now while we have understood while we have understood the budget uh, sorry the indifference curve now it is not like that individual has unlimited resources resources are there resources are scarce right there is a constraint on it and that constraint is in terms of budget the income level so a consumer's income is fixed and he has to distribute his income amongst different goods to reach an optimal level of you know consumption so the budget constraint we are taking here two goods for simplicity that you have px into qx that is amount of money that is spent on good x plus py into qy right that is amount of money that is spent on good y which is equal to your money income okay now there are two possibilities in this case a budget constraint a budget constraint can either show you a shift or it can show you a change in slope right now shift of budget line shifting of a budget line would mean that you can consume you can consume more of both the goods right you can consume more of both the goods so this is the level of increase which is there and it is mostly it is mostly in case of increase in income so when your income increases the budget line shifts rightwards and if your income decreases the budget line shifts leftwards so a shift in the budget line is caused due to change in income and he said that in uh, while we were doing uh, increase and decrease in demand that if a factor 
that is not mentioned on either of the two axes, if there is a change in that kind of a factor, there will always be a shift, right? So here we are dealing with good X and good Y only. So we are not considering money income. And that is why there is a shift in the budget line. Okay. Similarly, what if, what if your price of good Y, good say X, it falls. Price of good X falls. So this would mean that now you can consume more of good X. Right? So when you can consume more of good X, then your budget line, your budget line would move outwards. Okay? So you can consume more of good X. And this outward is only due to fall in price because agar price will fall only then you can consume more of it. Similarly, if a price rises, if there is a rise in price of X, right? Now you can consume less of X. So this would move the budget line inwards. Okay. Similarly, we can identify the same for good Y as well. Right? We can identify the same for good Y in the sense that... Mm -hmm. Now, this is the budget line. This is the budget line. Okay? Now, if price of Y falls, right, then you can consume more of good Y. So your budget line would move outwards and if price of Y falls, sorry, increases, you can buy less of good Y now. So it will move downwards. Okay. Okay. So last topic for the for the day, we'll just do the consumer equilibrium. Now, how does a consumer, how will a consumer reach the equilibrium level? First is that you are given an indifference map, you are given the income level, you are given the prices and which are constant and you are given the goods that are homogeneous and divisible, right? So graphically, Graphically, your consumer equilibrium will be achieved where your indifference curve is tangent. It is tangent. It does not intersect. It is tangent to the budget line. And at this price, and at this point, right, the slope of indifference curve, that is MRS XY which is nothing but equal to marginal utility of X upon marginal utility of Y will be equal to the slope of the budget line, which is if it is downward sloping, then PX upon PY. Okay. So this is the condition of equilibrium. Now you need to remember that this is only the first order condition. This is just the first order condition. The second order condition says that your indifference curve at this point should be convex. There can be a possibility that this is the thing. I'll just mark it with a different pen. There can be a condition here. Right? So this, the concave indifference curve will not give you that optimum level of satisfaction simply because you're sacrificing more and more of a good right for each additional unit of good x you're sacrificing more and more of good y for each additional unit of good x which is not possible simply because the goods are not perfect substitutes they are imperfect substitutes so you need to consume both x and why? So that is why 
The first order condition says that MRS XY, the slope of interference curve, should be equal to the slope of the budget line. And the second order condition says that at this point of tangency, the interference curve should be convex to the origin. Okay. Good till here? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So, we'll continue this tomorrow, right? And we'll finish off uh, the substitution effect and so on, right? Any query, anything till now? No, ma'am. And I'm uh, asking again, you're comfortable with the pace? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Right.